Now, the final plenary session for our conference on participatory development. Uh, we, we're introducing, reintroducing our, our keynote speakers, Alan, Robert, Emily, and Gita, but we're also introducing three new colleagues here, uh, and I'll just go through them from uh, left to right. So, we have Paul Nichols, and Paul is a very, very experienced development worker. He's, he's, he's worked for a quarter of a century, it says here. Uh, <laughs> I've known him for a long time. I remember the days when I had hair that I knew him, and that's a very long time ago. And he, he's worked for World Vision, uh, International Development Support Services, uh, which was a, a well-known consultancy uh, uh, connected to Oxfam Australia. And he's worked a lot overseas in Asia and Africa and the Pacific, but currently he's working as Assistant Director General of the South Asia branch in AusAid, but he has done a lot of other things inside AusAid over the time as well and is a very creative thinker there. So we're very pleased to have you here, Paul. I'd also like to warmly welcome Julia Newtonhouse, who is the C Chief Executive of Care Australia and also the Vice President of ACFID and Julia's been in that role for five years uh, at Care and she's really uh, championed Care's role in that time ensuring gender equality and women's empowerment uh, in Care's programs and she's also worked in AusAid where she was Assistant Director General and she's on the board of Care International as well and so I think we'll, we'll look forward to hearing what Julia has to say about participation. And then finally, Elizabeth Reid. And Elizabeth is a very uh, well known to many of us in the sector as a development practitioner, a feminist and an academic, and has worked extensively in all continents, uh, including the former Soviet republics. And she's worked with the United Nations. She was a founding director of the United Nations Development Program uh, the HIV and Development Program, and she's been made an Officer of the Order of Australia for her service in international uh, development work. And currently, she's a visiting fellow at the Gender Relations Centre and the School of International and Political and Strategic Studies at the College of Asia and Pacific at the ANU. Welcome, Elizabeth. To kick us off, Alan has suggested that I ask our three uh, new new guests on the panel, just to give their conception or their view about what participation means in their work. And then we're going to hand back over to Alan and pick up some of the themes of the conference and bring them together with the full panel. And then we'll put it over to you for questions. So beginning with Paul, what does participation mean in your work, Paul? fundamentally uh, our minister, our taxpayers and yourselves. Um, what does that mean in my everyday life, in my everyday work? Um, it doesn't mean that I'm not committed, it doesn't mean that I don't find space, or well, that there aren't uh, a myriad of opportunities to do participation and to be a good development practitioner uh, in my day-to-day -day, day -day work. Um, but it does mean that you have to work at it and you have to find those opportunities and you have to um, overcome the institutional, the internal barriers uh, to make participation possible. Uh, some of those, those barriers are really very familiar to us. The fact that we need to identify and plan our objectives and our results before we start, before we consult, before we ask what the audience are, before um, people have an opportunity to express their views, that's a big problem. Uh, the fact that, that me and my colleagues are the delegates, we actually have the power and we make the decisions. It's very hard to actually transfer power or enable power to be exercised in a different manner 
in an organisation that expects me to be accountable, fully accountable, and to front up to a set of estimates and, and to others for the decisions that I make. So there are some really significant kind of barriers and obstacles. Um, but there are also very significant uh, opportunities. Um, the, the challenge is to find the space, um, to have the ideas, uh, to be creative and innovative, um, and to use the systems in a way that, that explores the possibility for power to be shared, for partnerships to be formed, for relationships to be <coughs> more important than tasks. Uh, and then I'm really pleased to be able to say there are many, many examples where that, where that is possible in, in the official uh, aid agency. Um, but it's not the norm, it's not easy, and it's not straightforward to do that. Uh, the real challenge, I think, then, for those of us who are practitioners in the agency, and for those of you who are outside the agency, but also care about what happens in the Australian agency, is to be able to tell that story um, about why participation makes a difference, and to gather the evidence and use the evidence to tell that compelling story for the constituents who have the power, who do matter, so that they expect and demand participation as the norm. And we've got some way to do that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. Julia. Participation, well, I'm only the CEO, but I know that it's a bit daunting to uh, talk about participation in front of this uh, inspiring group of uh, scholars, academics, um, practitioners, and I spend way too little time in the field. So, um, you know, I would like to just say that in reading all the abstracts, because none of us could possibly get to all the um, parts of this conference, I've been really impressed by a couple of things. And, and one is that there is a lot of rigour, I think, in the work that's been presented in, in, this, um, uh, in the conference. There is a real sense that the work that's being presented is building on the traditions, the existing body of knowledge, taking it forward in specific contexts. And I think then, in, within my role, I am committed to ensuring that, from the perspective of CARE Australia and CARE International, that our commitment to um, to ensuring that our programs respond to the aspirations of the communities we work with is uh, influenced by the real, you know, the 20 years of building of knowledge and understanding around participatory development. So it's good to see a number of care staff here um, at the conference and to know that some of our papers were presented here. Um, I think we've got something of a tradition of um, basing our work, ensuring our work is well situated within uh, the sort of global knowledge around uh, a range of, of uh, development issues and particularly um, participation and with a particular commitment to understanding issues around uh, gender and uh, how to change and influence uh, harmful gender norms around, uh, around uh, uh, in, in development, different development contexts. You know, I think it's a real privilege to work in and on and with development issues and going into communities. Uh, it's unsurprising that some of the communities we work with are um, hugely conservative because if something goes wrong, frankly, they've got a lot to lose. And uh, so, Robert, I was intrigued and supportive in one sense of some of your opening comments where you said we must be allowed to fail. But we have to, you know, that failure can have some devastating consequences where we work. So I think we have a duty as development practitioners to think very carefully to engage in the um, to engage with the community on uh, on issues of um, principle and practice to you know to be able to as has happened uh, at at some of the sessions at this conference to to critique some of the accepted norms and to really look at 
the context in which we're working uh, very carefully as we work with uh, with some you know some of the people who have the smallest number of assets uh, in, in, in the world. So I guess my commitment, um, Mark, is really around a commitment to an organisation that is a learning organisation that uh, seeks to engage with the sector to not only build uh, our understanding within care with our partners, but also within the sector more broadly so that we can be uh, doing absolutely you know, the most thoughtful work when, when we uh, work in partnership with different communities. Thank you, Julia. Elizabeth. What does participation mean to you and your work? Good, thank you. Uh, in the work I do, participation for me means, beyond all else, it means passion. It means energy, it means striving, it means desire. So participation is a process of moving forward. So it's a process of essentially because it's about passion and energy and striving, it's about people. It's about people being passionate and doing what they want to do and trying to change the world in the ways they want to do it. If it's about people, it means there's going to be a lot of fragility, there's going to be a lot of tension, there's going to be a lot of backsliding as well as forward sliding, sideways sliding, but it also won't work unless that process, or therefore it won't work unless that process is building on the goodness in people, in people participating. Uh, and something that we often forget. So participation for me is very definitely about values and bringing out and creating the spaces in which people can work from the goodness in them towards their aspirations and values. It therefore is also about voice. So it's a space of voice. And that means for most people who are there and who are passionate, it is a space of t storytelling. It may be a declamatory space traditionally, but it will also be a space of storytelling, even if that storytelling is done in a decla decla declamatory mode. And that's really important because that means that in those spaces, those stories are not just any old stories, but they're being told to teach and they're being told so that together we can learn. Uh, and so that's enriching these processes as we go forward. And because it's about agency and striving, sorry, about striving and passion, it's about agency. And it's a space in which agency is exerted and activism occurs. We've always filtered out all these words from our de development vocabulary, but they're all there behind participation essentially behind it. But it also participated for me is about essentially walking the talk. Showing rather than telling, as somebody said in the course of conference. Because if we are not living what we are talking about, if we're not each one of us there striving, working from our own energies and working along our own desire lines, we won't uh, we won't be truly in participatory mode. And therefore of course Participation is about relationships. It's about how rather than what, which I think also is at the core of our development work. And finally, I think participation, when conceived in this way, is essentially a feminist conception and must be entered into with a feminist or gender sensitivity because it cannot occur if the only passion that's being harvested in that space and driving that space is, uh, is the passion of certain people and not all people. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Now, Alan has been sitting down there, and you've noticed he's been taking notes as they speak, and so he's got some questions for all of our panellists, and I'd encourage our panellists, as, as uh, you listen to each other respond, uh, to perhaps take issue with what each other is saying. Over to you, Alan. Uh, thank you. Um, it says on the program a facilitator, um, and as you know, very often this means a facipulator. Um, 
that tries to bring together stuff that's happened in the conference. So I've basically got two types of questions, a nice one and a less nice one. <laughs> so we're going to start with the nice one and we'll start with, uh, with Emily, if you don't mind. Can you just sort of explain to, to us how you connect participation to power and accountability? It's three words that we've used, they've been floating around in a disconnected sort of way. But I think they should actually somehow be connected. And if you can help us understand how you connect the three, which is an advantage to the rest because they're going to be able to piggyback. But anyway, I had to start with somebody and you are dressed in the right, uh, as you've explained, in the, the colour purple. Are you trying to be nice to me? Uh, with difficulty, but I'll do my best. <laughs> okay. Well, um, how I connect participation, power and accountability. The word that always comes up in my mind, two words that always come up in my mind is ownership and negotiation. And I think that's because I always want to take ownership of, of the situation that I'm in. But that can also be a privileged position. And this is where power comes in. Because when I consider my you know, relatives, people I have relationships with, you know, consider age, status, and certainly in the Pacific, most of our communities and societies are quite hierarchical. So it's very important to understand power structure and understand power relationships. Because if you don't understand, you know, when you're coming into a village, there is an etiquette and a protocol. And if you don't understand that, and you just go to the woman that you want to speak with, then you basically stuffed it up for her and for you. So, so, so behind the, the ownership, it, it's kind of, um, you know, I talk about the back doorway or the front door or the side door and the door is not open, you go through the window. It's kind of understanding, you know, doing a sort of quick power analysis. What is the power? And, you know, who in this room has the power? I would go to a function and I would say, um, okay, you know, we, or if, you know, if I want to take, if I want something to happen, if I want a community, I would try to figure out who has the power to do something. But it's not just the power, but it's also the power of influence. I think it's, it's important for one to understand also one's own power and how we can use that influence. In terms of accountability, I think ultimately, whatever we do, we are accountable, one, for our own actions, but also accountability means that you have to um, and I'm just trying to think of the word here. I'm trying to use the, I don't, I don't want to use the word deliver, but at the end of the day, you know, you, you, you got to, you've got to be able to say, from participation, this is what you get at the end of it. And I'm always thinking about those who are not in this room, those who rely on me to create that space, that ultimately my accountability is to them. As a leader in an organization, I also have accountability for the resources that I use. Um, and so that's um, another issue that, that I always carry with me, which brings me to negotiation. If you don't have the negotiation skills, if you don't understand how to negotiate, um, then I think you are not going to be in a very powerful position or you won't be in the power situation um, and in many cases, um, I think you will also be accountable. Thank you. Can I pass this to Gita and ask you the same question? Um, perhaps with a slight angle of an argument that accountability without sanction is hollow. <laughs> okay, you've got to change the question for Robert as well. Okay, all right. <laughs> It's I, I, I mean, I've just been saying, thank God I wasn't asked this question. Um, okay, I'm going to give a very quick don't, don't worry, it'll, it'll, it, 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 this is a reflection that matures as we go on. Okay, all right, very good. 
Um, okay. Um, I think the answer to the question, and I've already forgotten the twist. Connection, accountability, power. That bit I got. I can give twist you. Of the twist, the of twist was accountability without, without sanction sanctions. is hollow. Oh, all right, all right. Okay. So let me do the first bit. I think participation is what makes power accountable. Um, simple one sentence answer. Um, and uh, of course, um, or I should probably put it, participation can make power accountable. Um, it doesn't necessarily always do so, but it is what can do it. In terms of um, sanction, um, accountability without sanctions, well, I don't understand how it's accountability then. Because if you don't have, um, uh, if you don't have the sanctions, and by, and by that I assume you mean, oh, here we go with English again, um, you don't mean sanction in the sense of permission, but you mean sanction in the sense of bang you on the head if you don't do it. Um, so, um, so sanction, there is no accountability without sanctions because, because how are you, if I'm powerful, how are you going to make me accountable unless it's going to cost me something? To do it, and the sanctions are what's going to what's going to make it costly for me not to do it. And you can be nice to me and point me in all the wonderful directions of how being a nice person and being accountable will do it. But in the end, if I say, "Oh yeah, right, sounds marvelous," and carry on on my way, you need something with which to bang me on the head and say, "Do it or else." Do you want this one? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to have a go. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> if, if you want to have a go, uh, 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 Robert. Oh, wait. Twist. twist. <laughs> Robert, just, just, just wait a moment. Just Robert, Robert, Robert. Robert, 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 Robert. <laughs> Your twist is how poor people exert sanction. Just following on from what she said. How does that actually happen? in a power relationship in the aid system that are quite asymmetric. Well, I mean, then, good, because this is what I was going to say. <laughs> I'm not sure how to say it, but <laughs> it, it seems to me that, <clears throat> that the moment the word sanction is in there, I, I, I feel uncomfortable. Um, because the moment we're thinking about sanctions, we get into a whole, um, we're allowed to get into a whole area, particularly with up, upwards accountability, of concealment, of lies, of not reporting things, and of, then of not learning. And I think we've got to be extremely cautious about that. And anybody who's got power over for other people to be accountable to them, has got to be extremely cautious about sanctions indeed. If things don't work, then if it's well reported, they should say, well done, thank you for saying that, because this is something that we can all learn from. So it's making it positive in that direction. Now the other way around, <clears throat> in terms of the so-called downwards accountability, I think is much more difficult. But it's to do with enabling people to empower themselves and to do things themselves <clears throat> and to have procedures which enable them and encourage them to confront you if you are the person, I mean, I'm, I'm personalizing it, if you are the person, enabling them to, to come and, and say truth to you. This isn't working, we don't like that. Something should change here. And if, if the whole process is participatory, and if you can build in procedures and meetings and encourage and enable people to express themselves, and this is across gender and, and, and marginalization and, and I mean, the, all, all, of these, all of these differences, then I think it's possible to have accountability without so much sanctions, but much more with feedback which is accepted and which is acted on.
So the shadow side of sanction. Yeah? And a passive versus active feedback from downward accountability is often people don't sustain change once you've gone. But people do exert sanction actually in their own way. And the question partly is then, at what moment are they prepared to take the risk to take, to, to take the step that you just said, when they don't think the person they're going to speak to is either amenable or is in a position, because of where they are within the aid chain, to actually be able to respond. That's, that's a tricky one. So what I'd like to move to is just to move down the table, if you don't mind, to, uh, um, to Julia, to ask you the same question. How does you or, or, or the organization you lead connect power, accountability, and participation? Perhaps then from the perspective of sustainability. <laughs> <laughs> Last question you'll be reading out is all novel, I think. Um, <laughs> um, so these questions getting longer and longer, and it's going to be a short novel, but um, uh, you get to the end of the table. I, I think, you know, I think Emily's, uh, or no, sorry, Gita said um, participation should make power accountable. And, uh, I think that's absolutely right, and you know, in a simplistic way, the sanction on a politician who doesn't respond to uh, the desires of the electorate is to lose office, and that's the, the sanction we have. Um, I, I think Robert was wise in saying, um, you know, we need to think carefully about sanctions because they lead to lies and obfuscation and hiding of things. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, um, we are uh, trying to ensure that we have uh, good complaints mechanisms that are accessible, um, ways in which community members can raise concerns, um, either anonymously or hopefully if they, uh, you know, hopefully within a community context. But, I mean, this is ultimately linked to sustainability because clearly if what you're doing had, you know, is creating concerns amongst those, amongst those communities and there isn't a way to raise those concerns and for us to change what we're doing, ultimately what we're doing is not going to be sustainable. So I think it's, you know, in some ways it's simply putting, you know, this, this is a positive feedback or that, um, that you know, if operating correctly leads to sustainability and if the feedback loop doesn't exist of that accountability, then things will not be sustainable. So it's very good to know if that's it. We're going to do one sort of more round um, with a new f uh, offered me, uh, Elizabeth, a segue into the tricky question. So thank you, which is you're going to get first and then we'll go to, to Paul. And then we're going to do a QA. and a Okay, so then it'll be open to the floor and my colleague over there um, will, will moderate that. You offered a very, very good link to a second question that I have when you, when you stress the point of walking the talk. So, what I'd like you to do is, is to try and say, when you look across the aid system with which you're very familiar, across the aid system with which you're familiar, what strikes you as the most glaring hypocrisy <laughs> when it comes to participation? So when we look across the aid system and it's talk about participation and partnership and stuff, what, why is that hypocrisy there? And what do you think could be done about it? And I'm going to offer Paul the opportunity to follow on. So you know, <laughs> forward is forearmed. You offer me the opportunity with this walking the talk. And if you're not walking the talk, if you want a few minutes to think about it, unfortunately you don't have to think. <laughs> so, hypocrisy. Yeah. What do I see as a 
Nigerian proxy in the aid system around participation? participation. I think, for me, the answer is participation. Um, I think that participation is, in fact, very hard. It's really not easy to do. And the how we do a question, I am a little sorry that we didn't spend a bit more time working on that in the context of this conference. We know how to describe what we would like to be the case, but how we actually do it. And in our work, we start with the principle. So here now I'm talking very much about the work I do around community conversations. So if we are working to train local facilitators, the rule is, or the process is, if you want to work within your community or any other community to help people sit down and talk through their differences, come together, participate within their communities, you start with yourself. You look within yourself and you say, is that the way I'm living my life? And if your answer has some tension in it, work on that tension and improve yourself in a way that becomes visible to those around you, first and foremost, your family. When you feel that you have worked on yourself and are beginning the process of walking the talk, then sit down and work with your family slash friends, the family. Explain to them what you're doing and why you're doing it, and seek their support to do it. So that they understand the concept of walking and talking in the context, and can then ask themselves the question of whether they would do it. And it's only when you've been through that process that you would even consider starting anywhere else in your community. And we have just done that process uh, in our community conversations work in Barnes in the in the Highlands, the Duarte province of Papua New Guinea. It was suspended six months before the election because it just wasn't safe for our facilitation teams to go into the village. So what they did instead over that six months was bring teams of five youth from uh, a number of villages around. They insisted on gender balance, wouldn't take any team that wasn't gender balance, two, three, three, two, it didn't matter. They asked somebody who was a problem youth, so these were youth leaders, so somebody was a leader in the sense that they were a problem leader to be part of that. And then they brought them in for a series of workshops, but the message was, go back, start with yourself, then your family. And only then will you talk to your communities about the election, how not to get HIV infected during the election processes, and how to be a democratic citizen in your village, whatever the reality of your village is in that part of the election process. And in our feedback on that, what, what every, all these young people, women and men, but particularly the young women, talked about was the magic of starting with themselves. For them it was magic and it was absolutely transformative. And after that they had, if you like, that confidence or the ability to move out through those circles of growing agency uh, and participation, draw people into them, but draw people into them through their behaviour, rather than by saying, we're going to have a community meeting, you come, or else. Is that it? Yes, but, but <laughs> it's around the influence of what you've just said is, if that process is not in play, the outcome will probably be hypocrisy. Certainly. If that's what I'm trying to Yes, the outcome will be. Well, the point is that the, I guess what, that's a double negative, isn't it? That that is an essentially unhypocritical process. Uh, the hypocritical process would be if you went out and told others what to do and you hadn't changed yourself. So there are a number of things that flow from that. And the first is that nothing you do will be sustainable unless those processes occur. That is, if people aren't driven from within, be that a striving to improve oneself or a striving to change one's life, there will be sustainability of participation occurs through those processes that come. Hypocrisy in, in that context, really, hypocrisy per se has no place. But we have to say that that's an unsubtle sledgehammer because I think of in our facilitation teams, for example, we try great diversity, not just gender, but age and status. And we often will have a traditional leader. 
And one of our rules is that you don't sit at the front of the village, you sit on the ground, scattered around the community. You are not the expert of the upfront people, the outside, you're just sitting there. And for traditional leaders in this context, it is very difficult to sit. They have never sat in their lives to speak, ever. And so that's okay. So it's not that they're, they're not transgressing these processes. It's not hypocritical for them to say, I facilitate this process, but I do it standing. Because they come to understand why they, it might be important for them to sit, or the right thing to do for them to sit. And, and the testimony of those men who have sat, the traditional leaders who have sat and talked from a seated position, has been extraordinary in terms of the effect on their lives. So I guess what, if you allow me to continue with the double negatives. I'm also a bit of things. Keep pushing. <laughs> you can keep going with the double negative. But I'm close. Yes, I'm close. <laughs> no, I like the double negatives. Thank you. Paul, a glaring hypocrisy in relationship to participation in the innate system. What do you see? Why is it there? And what can be done about it? Firstly, I'm certainly not going to talk about Los in this context. <laughs> <laughs> now, please. <laughs> Being uh, an official representative of said organisation, but uh, to offer an observation of the made architecture of the AIDS system in terms of hypocrisy, um, I think there's a, actually a very strong link uh, to, to the idea of accountability and what accountability actually means. So, um, uh, as a personal reflection, I think. Um, Organisations like Aussie that are, are both uh, very accountable, the most accountable I've ever been is working in a formal bureaucracy with formal power structures and um, having to explain the decisions and explain myself and be questioned. Um, now, no other organisation in 20 years that I worked for um, made me accountable in that manner whatsoever. So I think there's some real uh, interesting lessons from that. And one of those for me is that um, it, it's very uncomfortable. Being accountable means putting yourself in a position of, um, of giving up some power and um, being vulnerable to being questioned and challenged and, and being in a contested space. Um, so the question, how that relates to hypocrisy, I think, in the context of the international aid architecture, is that we all operate kind of institutionally as, as the pot calling the kettle black, as if we've got nothing to learn and nothing to change. Um, the big issues that face us kind of um, in, in development terms are, are issues that now face the developed world. So issues of climate change, issues, issues of um, inequality in economic growth and economic distribution. Um, we don't all want to end up like Europe has at the moment or like America is ending up. Um, so for emerging middle income economies in, in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and, and places that are working out, um, the question is not so much um, how can we help these countries do better and be more like us? You know, that's, that question is long gone. That's clearly not what we should be doing. But we still behave and operate as if that's the question we should be answering and, and behaving structurally in that manner. So being accountable um, deals with the question of, of hypocrisy in my mind. Um, uh, to do good development, to behave with um, uh, the ideas of participation and principles of participation is to make ourselves individually and institutionally vulnerable to being questioned and to being willing to change and to reform and to be part of the development process collectively, not be part of the development process for other people. And I think the whole aid architecture has a very long way to go to absorb that idea and, and think about being accountable means being willing to be vulnerable and to change and reform ourselves as the starting point for how we encourage others to do the same. But it mirrors very much what has uh, just been said. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm not speaking on behalf of Holly, obviously. Um, obviously. Obviously. Um, the tricky bit in relationship to participation and then this sort of hypocrisy is that, and in relationship to accountability specifically, which I'd like you all to reflect on before I offer you the opportunity to say something is this the point very often that um, the degree to which um, <coughs> downward accountability works in participation, in relation to participation, is that it's still in the gift of the powerful. And that's a bit of a paradox. 
It's still the path of saying, we are prepared to forego. And how does that work? What do you think motivates an institution or motivates people to prepare to forego that which is in their gift, if you see what I mean? And how that ties into the relationship between power and accountability and participation. Do you have any reflections on that before I move this way? Just briefly, please. When power is in your gift to disempower yourself, what, what happens? Are we facing a hypocrisy because we know that what need, that's what needs to be done? The paradox is that we simply can't or won't do it. I could only think of one thing to say, but I've rescued myself in a second. So the, the first thing that, that I was going to say is, I think we've got to be kidding ourselves that most people in most organisations actually are willing to give up any power whatsoever. So I think actually we are all fundamentally motivated by power and are unable to, to, to exercise it differently to, to the, the cultural norms to which we are exposed. But I can rescue myself from that statement by saying I don't think it's a zero-sum zero game. In fact, my personal experience, even within an organisation like WASAG, but certainly in others where I think we can do this much more easily, is that, that the, the sharing, the distribution, the, um, the willingness to let go of power actually creates a dynamic of where, where the collective power is much stronger than the power that we started with. So that would be my kind of resolution to that problem. All right, thank you. Can I ask you, Dieter, Dieter, just to reflect on the same issue, because I won't repeat the question, you've heard it, and then I'll ask uh, Emily, and then we'll move towards Robert, who was shaking his head and then holding his head. I was very nervous. Then we'll go to Julia, and then we'll close the panel, and then we'll put it out for q &A. So if I can ask you to be succinct, please, which I know is one of your skills. <laughs> okay. Um, Two big places where I think there's hypocrisy in the aid system. Um, one is a hypocrisy that's been going on for a very long time now, and that has to do with what sauce for the goose is not sauce for the gander. When it comes particularly to macroeconomics, to fiscal budgets, with um, it's the um, developing countries um, Latin America onwards have seen structural adjustment wiping them out. Um, and no one was, you know, what was going on within those countries was hardly making the pages of the New York Times. And yet when it comes to Europe, um, suddenly it's not that it's not being done, but it's, but it's all over the place, like, oh my goodness, the Greeks and the Spaniards and this and that. It's the same thing that we've all been going through for decades now. So when does it become crucial is when it starts becoming hitting at the center. And I think that that's a huge hypocrisy that we have to address because part of the challenge always has been that financialized globalization was a mess right from the beginning, but it hit the developing countries for the longest time and so it was fine. You could carry on with it. When it came home to roost is when everyone sort of woken up. And I think that's hypocrisy number one. Hypocrisy number two has to do with aid effectiveness. Um, and it particularly has to do with the business of ownership. Um, suddenly now we are, you know, Paris principles. Ownership. Okay, so what does ownership mean? Um, why does ownership, everyone knows that ownership by and large only means now that we don't really ask governments that are receiving aid to be quite as accountable as we all know they need to be. And right in the time when we have been, when civil society and everybody has been asking governments to be accountable about money that's disappearing all over the place, Suddenly, this is what ownership is all about. And I'm all, of, all for ownership, but where's the ownership of the people in these countries? Very little. Big hypocrisy. On hypocrisy, I think there's hypocrisy when 
development agencies and donors continue to fund corrupt governments, yet find it very difficult to address um, weak NGOs um, or community organizations that don't have the systems. Um, so I, I think that's the, the, one of the prophecies. In terms of the question about, you know, power is in your gift to disempower yourself, I guess for me I'm always motivated by, um, you know, my desire to do good, to do no harm, and to do what I do best. And I think that probably comes from my initial social work training where you work yourself out of the job. So if I have, you know, a consultancy on the offer or a powerful public servant in a position, I'm always thinking, what can I do with this part? But maybe that's the activist in me. And I always feel very sneaky, you know, that I'm kind of taking this off because I have another agenda. But maybe that's... I think there's a fallacy lurking here, which is the idea that power is a commodity. And that somehow or other, if you are empowering other people, you're, you're losing something. Um, I, it was the words you were using for the word, um, were, were give up and let go. Now, let go is, is, is in a way, it's different from, from give up. But if you are an upper, or in another position, say a funder, in some part of the, of the aid chain, you can gain both in effectiveness and in terms of personal satisfaction by empowering other people. You're not losing, you're gaining from that. Um, it's not, I mean, you, you did say it's not, a, it's not a zero sum, but I think we need to think about that. We need to think that one through much, much more. And one way of doing this is to have much stronger mutual agreements across <coughs> the levels of the so-called aid chain, in which um, the downward accountability is not just at the community level, which is where we tend to talk about it, but is at each stage in the aid chain. And one of the commitments that has come out very clearly from Listening for Change, the book that I have been recommending um, to all of you, one of the issues there is the personal dimension because they said in every case where there was a good, people were spoke well about aid, there had been a particular person and a particular relationship, and that means continuity. And one of the commitments that I would like to see made much, much more strongly, in fact, I don't think it's made at the moment, at all stages of the aid chain is to strive very, very hard for continuity so that relationships can be built up. Thank you. Um, ah, Julia, would you? Hello, hi. Julia, would you like to offer a reflection on hypocrisy, on Paradox of power, and then I'll pass it back to Mark to open up the floor for your Q and A from the back. Can I have the rest of you out of No, not no. No, um, no seriously. No. I uh, look. I think there are fundamental flaws within the whole aid, global aid architecture, in that there isn't a lot of honesty about why countries give aid. I know that um, the reasons a lot of Australians. Uh, make donations to aid agencies are based on misconceptions about aid and are really, you know, within very much a, a charity framework. The, you, you know, governments give aid frequently for a range of political reasons and yet, you know, they have lovely, um, lovely statements within the, the, the aid program about, you know, the Millennium Development Goals and you know, making the world a, a ju more just place and eliminating poverty. So, you know, and, and then I think um, things like the Paris Principles were, were ultimately incredibly hypocritical. So I, um, you know, I, I think we have to get some, a level of greater honesty. And part of that honesty is recognising that there are very strong voices who oppose any idea of giving aid that, um, you, know, the, the, you know, one only has to read The Australian here in Australia to see how strong the anti-aid, anti-government voices are from, from, um, 
from the right. And so, uh, you, you know, even giving aid is a contestation of power and the reasons behind it. So this, you know, I mean, I think this exists on many levels. The fact that the world has become so desperately unequal and that inequality has accelerated. We know even in the last couple of years, you know, if you look at GDP growth across the world, the amount of that that has gone to the wealthiest 0.0%, if it had been equally distributed amongst the, the, those in extreme poverty, we could have eliminated extreme poverty. But there is this battle to ensure that resources, you know, resources are ever more closely held by, um, by the most wealthy. But you know, we've got a huge problem here because we're just preaching to the converted. You know, I think that's one of my problems with this conference is how, how do we actually get a mature, more mature debate about these issues and how do we reach out to, um, to power holders to uh, have a better debate and to be able to challenge them in more constructive ways. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move to a different, uh, a different dynamic and offer the floor to you. Um, we've talked about power, we've talked about participation, we've talked about accountability, we've talked about hypocrisies, etc. Um, you don't have to restrict your questions, of course, to any of those. However, I would encourage you to try and make sure that's, that the angle of participation is in whatever you ask, please, because we can go all over the place otherwise. Mark, it's all yours. Thank you, Alan. And questions for Alan too now. We're opening the whole panel. So the, the lady in the spot. Yes, from the church. Yes, you first. Thank you. Um, I'd just like anyone on the panel to comment on the connections between um, the participation, demand for good governance or good governance, and hypocrisy. Particularly after I was in a presentation yesterday where we heard that a demand for good governance pro um, program in Vanuatu, which had been reasonably successful, was closed because the Vanuatu government asked was they to shut it down to effect So, But the general question of um, uh, the demand for good governance, I think it's, it's extremely difficult actually um, with the perspective of, uh, perspective of the insider um, when I'm out here, but of course when I'm in Ozan, I feel like I'm the outsider inside Ozan. Um, uh, for an official aid agency in a, in a government relationship to promote demand for good governance, I think it's actually very, very problematic. And I think it's really important that civil society and Australian NGOs and, and the Australian kind of the broader social movements um, have an eye to these things and, and we, we build on those people and people links and, and the broader uh, context in which those political changes can happen. I don't think we should expect, in fact, the aid program, which is a very small contribution to a much bigger political and power context, to be able to achieve some of the things that it's just not really um, established to do very well. Any other members of the panel? No? Uh, this gentleman and this lady. Thank you. Um, I have a very quick uh, comment and a, and, a, and a question for all of us, especially Chambers. Uh, so, Professor Chambers. Um, uh, we have been using the term participation for the last two, three days, but I don't, I don't see any distinction between the participation in the capital P as a taken in development in, in the aid sector, as against participation that we do in our everyday lives. So I would, I would like to see uh, your comments and also the comments from other participants on that. Um, how do we differentiate between the two? Um, and a very quick comment on the, on the, on the issue of hypocrisy. Uh, frankly, I don't like the use of this term because uh, once we use it, we cannot really control how far it goes. Uh, I'm, I'm a Muslim, so in a Muslim context, I have seen this can you know, play havoc with, with people's lives and, and with sincere intention. 
I would say uh, we as we have as as workers and practitioners of uh, 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 the development industry within the development industry, we are also agents acting on someone's behalf. So instead of think of, while thinking over the question, why would I give up my power to someone else, or why would I like to disempower myself? Having thought over 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 incentivizing the whole process, uh, and incentives could be physical or they could be spiritual, as 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 Robert touched upon, uh, and trying to bring more personality into it, uh, again, as against the sort of barbarian concept of you know disconnectedness, where public servants don't get to see the. The, the, the results of the action that they take. And so in, 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 in our current circumstances, you know, I can be posted to a uh, developing country, I can be posted there for two years, I can mess up with people's life, and I, I, I work with pretty much immunity, I come back, I get posted somewhere else. And so can't we really bring back some sort of incentive or disincentive, so to say? Could I be, uh, could the institution be reformed in a way that I get money, not necessarily physically, uh, 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 money-wise, but somehow, so that we at least bring more, more sort of, more effort into that. Thank you. Would any of the panelists like to respond? Rob. Rob. I mean, I completely agree with, um, in, in the answer to your, your first question, completely agree with um, what um, Elizabeth was, uh, was saying. Um, Although, in, in my own personal case, the participation started outside the family and came in rather late. <laughs> <laughs> my children have suffered as a result. Um, uh, but, but on the, on the other one, you see, I think there's a, I think there's, there's a, I, I really don't like the word incentive, which you've been using. I, I, mean, I, I don't think I know what you mean. But incentive is a word which has got debased because it tends nowadays in our, in our current environment to mean financial incentives. The satisfactions, the personal satisfactions of empowering other people to do things which are important for them are a huge reward in themselves. These, the satisfactions of good relationships with people are enormously satisfying in themselves. They're fulfilling. They can often be good relations, they can be fun, there can be a lot of the good things in life involved in it through empowering other people and enabling them to do things which they couldn't do before, which they want to do, and which are good for them, and which they feel are good for them. This lady here. And, and then the gentleman on the back, yeah. Um, hi. My, um, my question is, I guess, coming from uh, something that uh, Emily brought us this morning and um, you talked about whose development, if not mine, and thank you for that because I found that really um, insightful. And one of the things that you mentioned was the need to understand culture uh, and to interact with culture. And I guess one of the questions that, then, that leads me with is if the government's are all men. Uh, church leadership are male. Local leadership tends to be male. Then whose culture? Because um, we work with church leaders for um, a number of years in development, and at times we will hear that you know working for gender equality is an imposed concept. It's external. Um, but when we meet with the women's fellowships, and that's where we're trying to work with women's fellowships across the Pacific, we have a different take on that, we hear a different voice. And how do we work in authentic participation across a community with cultural relevance and respect when there's different cultural dynamics? Emily. Been a, yes, I've been expecting that question all day. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is the role of interlocutors. And I look at civil society because, you know, one would like to think that 
we are full of activists. You know, that, that is where you, you will have been liberated about something, either your manhood or your marriage or your, you know, that last statement that I said, you know, your liberation is bound up with mine. And as, as a human race, we have to look beyond race, we have to look beyond colour, and I think this is the role. And there's something that, that we, Piango, have been involved in, which is called non-government diplomacy. You know, every time we think of eminent persons, it's always eminent men. You know, every time we think of interlocutors, it's always some um, ex-military somebody. Um, you know, civil or, or NGO diplomacy, and I, I think, you know, um, men in Australia who have power uh, are always welcomed in the Pacific by Pacific men. But I think this is where the role of those few good men, you know, who are who have a feminist perspective, who, who are committed to the goals of change, um, and, and to, to be those interlocutors. And I think this is where you work in teams so that you need to talk to church leaders. Um, at this, because women are there, but those women won't come forward because the men are there. Yeah, I mean, that's, there are many more things I want to say, but I, I think this is how you, you, you work across cultures. You work, and you know, that third, um, I mean, you know, the third culture kid, kids, many of us are now operating in so many cultures, and I think those, that, that gives you a lot of perspective and skills to use those cross-cultural skills. And Julia, what's the next one too? Well, thank you. I'd like to build on, on something that uh, Elizabeth said, which was examining, you know, when you work with people, there's a process where it's about examining yourself and your own beliefs and behaviours. And um, so we um, or, uh, institutionally have a commitment to gender equality and women's empowerment. <coughs> the vast majority of our staff are you know, nationals and citizens and from the cultures in which we work in different countries. So we have developed some tools for examining one in particular called inner spaces, outer faces, so to really examine those cultural beliefs and social norms. So um, we have, we cannot have an expectation that staff we have will share a commitment to gender equality or even what that looks like. So to really spend time reflecting as an organisation with our staff around those issues that we've made a commitment to um, has been an important part and I know that it's, you know, um, it's actually something that we need to do more intensively and on an ongoing basis to ensure that um, you know that we are working to talk, that it's all very well to you know, be able to write journal reports that reflect these issues, but we you know it is something that as an organisation you have to live and breathe and be confident that your staff will live and breathe. So I think Elizabeth has been in talking about start with yourself. Um, and as an organisation, start with your staff and work outwards is, is an important aspect. Just a bit briefly, um, I, if I've understood what you said, I think what you're saying is what I've heard said in the, con in the conference. The participation, whilst it's important, is not necessarily sufficient for social change. And basically we're here because we're committed to social change of certain sorts. Um, so that we have to have participation plus something that is challenging the status quo, challenging power abusively used. So there is participation plus, and I think that one of the key words in Robert's presentation the first day was facilitation, and I think it's that's the situation in which facilitation comes into its own. It's a very difficult thing. You're doing it as the outsider or cross-culturally or whatever, you're assisting people to do it within culture, it is in the process of facilitation. What is a facilitator? What is facilitation? How do you teach people to facilitate? Next conference, these are some important questions. Thank you. This gentleman the second last row on this book right here, and then this gentleman here. Thank you very much for uh, the 
questions and the panelists over there. Um, uh, I want to ask about this question, the connection between uh, participation and monitoring. Um, for all of that, in my part of the world, there are many projects that are being implemented out there. The audiences will, I mean, invest a lot of money in it, but the monitoring aspect of the during implementation of the project is lacking. They normally monitor and evaluate after the projects have been finished. But during the process, monitoring is lacking. And that's where normally the most, most projects fail. So what, are the, what is the connection between the two? There's a, a, an organization in uh, South Africa that I relate to quite well. And I think part of the answer between participation and monitoring is what measures are being used. And, the, and I'm not going to, I get my tongue tied when I say this. We need to use the measures of the measured, not the measures of the measurer. Did that come across right? Yep. Okay. <laughs> If you're monitoring and participating in monitoring using other people's measures, it looks less well than if you're participating to measure your own measures of change. So if we start by using the measures of the measured rather than the measures of the measurer, then I think you'll get a stronger link between participation and monitoring of change over time because the measures are relevant to the participation itself. So the measures of the measured, not the measures of the measurer. Paul. That's my, my reflection on the question would be that um, we're going through a period at the moment of an obsession with monitoring and evaluation of results and results of a particular nature. And, and the, the, the link between monitoring and participation needs to be around the question of monitoring for what purpose and monitoring for learning and improving so we actually do end up with a better impact in the long run, which is going to be really critical. So as we go through the, the flavours of the month in the, in the development sector, we're going through a particular um, you know, phase of talking about results. But at the end of the day, it's the real impact and the change in people's lives that really matters, and that will come hard to reach if we don't think about participation in monitoring in a really effective manner. Thank you. This gentleman here. Yeah, well, 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 I'm going to ask Peter to think of a question to finish up on to ask Robert and Emily to think of a question to finish up, finish up on to, to ask Alan. <laughs> Don't call me sweetheart. So, so, <laughs> Thank you. Look, it seems to me now that uh, this question and this empowerment are in several very close. Uh, and uh, my question is to Gina and, and uh, Robert. Gina, this morning you said nobody can empower someone. Uh, 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 Robert, I have heard you over the past 15 minutes uh, using the phrase empowering others. Now, can you can you do some of this? <laughs> There's my question for Robert. <laughs> Good facilitation is in our room. <laughs> but I think that shows the way out of attention because one is about processes that empower, and the other is you deciding to act on another person to empower them. So the two, those two statements are compatible, and Robert showed us the way out. <laughs> so, two final questions. This gentleman here, and then. 
for him to be one from over here, so, and then the lady at the back, and then Ibrahim from the back. My question is, do you know how to answer? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I still hold to what I said. Um, I don't think anybody can empower anybody else. Um, and if empowerment is something about what happens to you inside, as much as it is about the change in your uh, circumstances, your environment, and what you're able to do, it's going to come from you. Um, I think what Robert may be referring to um, in a sort of, you know, sloppy shorthand, <laughs> is, <laughs> is um, that maybe someone else can create a facilitating environment which makes it possible, more easy for you to empower yourself. And sometimes that may just mean getting out of the way. Um, so, so that may be all it means is just get out of the way and let, let the women's group do its thing. Um, well, I mean, I, let me just take one example that's empowering. Convening people. I mean, convening women who otherwise wouldn't have met enables them to empower themselves. And then getting out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> it all depends whether they need allies. I, 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 I'd like to think that, that both of them haven't got it right. <laughs> in that, I have a similar line that, that Gita said, in that, you know, you can't change people, people change themselves. And I think what Robert, or what I think along the lines that Robert thinks is that you can create the enabling environment, the conditions, and that's the empowerment. That, um, you know, people need to be inspired. People need to be motivated. People need a reason to get out of bed and go and do that thing that will bring about the change. And I think that's the kind of empowerment. So, do you guys want to shake hands? <laughs> I'll just try to, I'll just try to so, facilitate. <laughs> two, two, two final questions. This gentleman here and then the lady up the back. And I'm sorry, then we're just going to round up because we're, we're, we're there in our time. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, when we talk about development, we think about the unequal relationship, unequal power dynamics, which, which has been created, you know, like by hundreds of years of cultural, social practices. You know, like in that context, where participating in the development comes in the locked frame, you know, like, periodic Can you, can, you, can you make your question a little bit? When you talk about you know, like, for example, like we have 100 years of, uh, or thousands of years, whatever, uh, cultural practices which has, which has created discrimination. Yeah. And there is unequal relationship, unequal power dynamics. But when you, you know, like develop our projects, when you think about the change, we create two years project, three years project, you know, like, we say the object is a block frame. I use this word, the block frame. It's not a block frame, block frame. You know, I call it. And where does participation go there? You know, like that's the question. Thank you. So, the question is about systemic power analysis and, and the nature of right short term data. Well, I think if I understand your, your question, it's about how in a two to three year long frame, long frame to project, how do you? change a thousand years of cultural attitudes and um, you know I think it's, it's a very reasonable statement and I you know many of us would question the two year long frame project and what you can achieve so uh, nevertheless I think it's important to recognise that culture is not static and there are many influences 
around the world that are creating massive changes to culture and in some instances it can change quite rapidly, certainly over a period of a decade in, in communities you can see very marked cultural changes. So, you know, I, I mean, I, I would agree with you in sort of characterising, you know, short, unrealistic interventions with sort of um, uh, results is, is, is not going to result in effective participation and, uh, and empowerment or, or change. A lady that's right at the back there. And I was to finish the finish oh, sorry, that. Yeah. But I think you're actually yeah, um, pointing out in a way the, the, the total sum conclusion of the conference in, to some extent. That is that, that if we take participation seriously, it doesn't just question some of the methods or some of the tools or some of the systems we have, it actually fundamentally challenges the nature of the enterprise that we think we're engaged in. So we've talked about a lot of things here, you know, how we've talked about the individual, the, the personal relationships, etc. But it's actually taking a kind of transformational view about um, social change and then thinking about from, from scratch, like to what kind of social organisation do we need to be engaged in to support and facilitate that? But well, I can tell you it's not sitting in OSAC, it's not sitting in care, and it's not sitting in World Vision. It's actually thinking about the enterprise we're engaged in a fundamentally different way, um, rather than just making current incremental little changes to some of the ways we do things. We're asking much bigger, bigger questions than that. Which I think you know. Hello. Uh, thank you for the conference and thank you to the participants and the um, panelists for organizing an excellent conference. I've learned a lot and I'm sure many people have. Um, my biggest question is uh, besides uh, putting the conference um, papers and everything into some conference proceedings document. Is there any specific action that will be taken with all these brilliant ideas to maybe take them to the policy makers or other people that are leaders in participatory development? Thank you.
to us. <laughs> so uh, if you want me to do that, give me another minute. Okay. And, 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 and have really a question for Alan. Alan's course. All right, Alan. I've been waiting for this moment. <laughs> <laughs> Alan. How do you link participation, gender equality, and mutual accountability? <laughs> How do you link participation, gender equality, and mutual. A mutual accountability? You link them very, very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> In context. Everyone to put their hands together to thank Paul.